This is Radio Health Journal. I'm Nancy Benson. This week, treating bladder cancer. It's about three times, maybe even four times more common in men than it is in women. The problem, though, is that women get more serious disease. It's a more aggressive disease in women. All about bladder cancer when Radio Health Journal returns. When it comes to health insurance, understanding what you'll pay for covered services, prescriptions, and supplies is important, especially if you have a chronic condition like diabetes. Now, there's a new tool to help people with diabetes save money on test strips. Know My Copay is a website and nationwide telephone service that tells you the lowest copays for the top five brands of diabetes test strips in the market based on your individual health plan. Here's consumer advocate and nationally syndicated columnist Jim Miller. Figuring out health coverage can be confusing. Know My Copay is a valuable free service that can help people maximize their health care dollar. By comparing the out-of-pocket cost of the various diabetes test strips available, people can make educated decisions about the products they use. Know My Copay is sponsored by LifeScan, maker of one-touch brand blood glucose monitoring systems. Find the lowest copay for your test strips at knowmycopay.com or by calling toll-free 1-844-844. 807-8936. That's knowmycopay.com. The body's urinary system doesn't get much respect, but it has an important job, filtering out toxins and waste products from the bloodstream, then transporting those out of the body. With a job like that, the urinary system is exposed to a lot of substances that can do us harm. And that brings consequences. For example, bladder cancer. About 75,000 Americans are diagnosed with bladder cancer every year, and 15,000 people die of it. But some people are much more likely to develop bladder cancer than others. It's about three times, maybe even four times more common in men than it is in women. The problem, though, is that women get more serious disease. It's a more aggressive disease in women. That's Dr. David McConkie, Director of Urological Research at the MD Anderson Cancer Center and newly appointed Director of the Johns Hopkins Greenberg Bladder Cancer Institute. It's the world's only institution dedicated solely to research and treatment of bladder cancer, the fourth most common cancer among men. Male hormones, androgens, seem to contribute to the growth of bladder cancers. And so that has been studied mostly in good studies in epidemiologic cohorts, but also in animal models in the laboratory. And so if you actually purposefully modulate the androgen receptor, you can decrease bladder cancer incidence in in these models. So we're pretty sure that testosterone receptor actually contributes to bladder cancer growth. Men may also be more likely to work in industrial jobs that put them in contact with toxic chemicals, another bladder cancer risk factor. Another risk factor that's been suggested is exposure to certain metals in the environment. So arsenic is high on the list of candidates. Others may be also involved. Exposures to these metals can be through occupations, certainly people who are exposed to metals in mines and things like that, but also through environmental contaminants. And so, again, the idea is that passing through the body, they transit through the bladder, and maybe in those people who don't drink enough water, and so there's a longer time that those chemicals are in the bladder before they're eliminated, that they cause problems either directly through DNA damage or maybe indirectly by causing inflammation. McConkie says the link is unproven between bladder cancer and drinking too little water. It's also an unproven link that genetics are involved. We think there's a familial component to bladder cancer, just as we know now that certain women are predisposed to breast cancer through genetic inheritance. But the research in bladder cancer is behind the research in breast cancer. We're hoping that situation changes with growing awareness of the importance of bladder cancer. And also, we hope to kind of leverage the work that's gone on in breast cancer now that we know that the two diseases are actually kind of similar. Most commonly, the first bladder cancer symptom that gets people into the doctor is blood in the urine. But McConkie says a lot of other disorders could also be to blame. Most often, blood in the urine does not mean bladder cancer. It means something else. We don't want people to panic because they might find blood in the urine. Actually, the more common explanation is infection. And so somebody with blood in the urine going to see his or her doctor would probably have a workup for infection first. And if it didn't appear that there was any infection in the bladder, then there would be a workup to see if there's another cause that might include bladder cancer. 
But blood in the urine is the is the usual first sign, and it can look like a lot to somebody. Even a trace amount of blood can be noticeable in the urine. Most of the time, bladder cancer is detected early enough that it hasn't invaded beyond the inner layers into the muscular outer wall. Probably 70 to 80 percent of the cancers fit into this category, and those cancers are not usually lethal. Instead, they oftentimes can be managed by an outpatient surgical procedure. Transurethral resection is what it's called. A patient can go home the same day. And then the only concern is these cancers often come back. And so patients with these non-muscle invasive bladder cancers need to see their doctors regularly, essentially forever. McConkie says survivability of lower-grade cancers such as these can be more than 90%. However, they're very expensive to manage. Patients may live for decades, every so often requiring another costly procedure. The higher grade cancers are still very survivable, but they're managed a little bit more aggressively. Usually when they become high grade, the patients are managed first with a therapy called BCG, which is instilled into the bladder and is very effective. It causes tumors to go away in about 70 to 80 percent of cases. Again, the problem, though, is that after these high-grade cancers first respond to this drug BCG, they tend to come back. And the goal here is to help patients keep their bladders. And the concern is that surgeons don't want to wait so long that the tumor spreads to distant places in the body and then becomes incurable. So they know these cancers are potentially high risk, but they also know that they can be usually managed with aggressive therapy. And the goal is to balance the benefit of helping the patient keep his or her bladder against the risk associated with leaving what could be a potentially lethal disease in the bladder. As you'd expect, cancers that have invaded the muscular wall can be much more serious. While some of them, about half of them, can be managed either with surgery alone or surgery plus chemotherapy, the other half can be very aggressive and can progress very rapidly. And these cancers are thought to be almost as aggressive when they fit into this category as some of the more famous aggressive cancers like pancreatic cancer and metastatic melanoma, etc. So muscle invasive cancer is not something to mess with. Doctors and patients need to carefully weigh their options in these cases. McConkie says there really are just two choices. One would be to take out the bladder. And in the case of that, with chemotherapy added on, the survival rates are probably around 60 to 70 percent. The other approach would be to use radiation therapy, much as being used in prostate cancer, usually with some form of chemotherapy. They call that combination chemoradiation. And in Europe, this is used more frequently than it is in North America, and in fact is in many sites preferred to taking out the bladder. And of course, the advantage is that the patient gets to keep his or her bladder. McConkie says a lot of work still needs to be done to investigate survival rates of aggressive radiation and chemotherapy versus bladder removal. But he says he believes we can reduce the number of people who lose their bladder and still survive. And that would be a major step forward in preserving people's quality of life. You can find out much more about bladder cancer and its treatment from the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network at bcan.org or through links on our website, radiohealthjournal.net. You'll find archives of our shows there as well as on iTunes and Stitcher. Our production director is Sean Waldron. I'm Nancy Benson. Medical Notes This Week. Death certificates don't usually mention medical mistakes as a cause of death, but a new study suggests that maybe they should. The study in the journal BMJ finds that medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the United States, accounting for more than 250 deaths every year. Researchers say it's not because of bad doctors, but rather a result of systemic problems such as poorly coordinated care and fragmented insurance network. The study concludes that only heart disease and cancer kill more Americans than medical mistakes. Happy marriages apparently make men more likely to get a colonoscopy. A study in the journal Preventive Medicine finds that older married men are about 20% more likely to have had a colonoscopy in the past five years than single men. And if they're in a happy marriage, that advantage climbs to nearly 30%. If the wife is highly educated, married men are 40% more likely to get a colonoscopy. But women, married or single, their colonoscopy rates are the same. Heart bypass surgery doesn't last forever, and a new study shows that many patients aren't taking the medications meant to keep bypass grafts open. 
Bypass recipients are often prescribed statin drugs and aspirin, but the study in the American Journal of Cardiology shows that only about half of patients take both as prescribed. Most take only one. Scientists say that most career criminals start their antisocial behavior as toddlers. Now they've found a way to identify those children most at risk of carrying on that behavior beyond the terrible twos. A study in the American Journal of Psychiatry finds that those children display what's called callous unemotional behavior, including lack of empathy, lying, and little emotion. That kind of behavior is encouraged by harsh negative parenting. The good news is that high levels of positive reinforcement can reverse antisocial behavior. And finally, older men with enlarged prostates often make numerous trips to the bathroom every night, but a new study indicates that a synthetic nasal spray hormone could help them get a good night's sleep. The study presented to the American Urological Association shows that the spray prompted most patients to make at least two fewer trips to the bathroom each night by delaying the production of urine for four to six hours. And that's Medical Notes this week. More in a moment. Thank you for listening to Radio Health Journal, a production of MediaTrax Communications. If you enjoyed this week's show, please leave a review on iTunes or share it with a friend. You can find more Radio Health Journal stories about health, science, and technology on iTunes, Stitcher, and at RadioHealthJournal.net.